Welcome to the part 3 of Introduction to CFD series. In this video, I will briefly introduce the boundary conditions used in CFD. During CFD modeling, while the CFD is responsible for calculating the flow properties in the region within the computational domain, it is our responsibility as the CFD users to prescribe the correct flow conditions or the value of certain flow properties at the boundary of the computational domain. Since the CFD solution for flow within the computational domain depends on the setting of the boundary conditions, therefore, the use of appropriate boundary conditions is essential to the accuracy of, of the CFD solution. Depending on the CFD package, there are several types of boundary conditions available. In this video, I will only discuss those typically used in CFD modeling. Since the computational domain is treated as a control volume, it normally comprises one or more boundaries through which fluid enters the domain or leaves the domain. The boundary condition used for these inflow and outflow boundaries are generally categorized as either velocity specified conditions or pressure specified conditions. This is because we can only choose to specify the velocity and let the CFD calculate the pressure or specify the pressure and let the CFD calculate the velocity. Specifying both the velocity and pressure will lead to mathematical over specification since these two flow properties are coupled in the equations of motion. When we specify the velocity, the pressure will adjust itself to match the rest of the flow field as the CFD solution converges, such that the prescribed velocity boundary conditions are satisfied. Similarly, when we prescribe the pressure, the velocity will adjust itself during iterations to satisfy the pressure. A special case is with the outflow boundary condition, in which both the pressure and velocity information are not needed. Instead, flow properties are extrapolated from the interior and are forced to have zero gradients normal to the outflow phase. This boundary condition is appropriate if the acid flow is fully developed. However, there are limitations in its application. First, it cannot be used with a pressure inlet boundary. We must use velocity inlet. Second, it cannot be used for unsteady flows with variable density. This boundary condition is intended for use with incompressible flows. Finally, it will lead to poor convergence rate when backflow occurs during iterations. If the flow is still developing but the pressure at the outlet is known, a pressure outlet boundary condition will be more appropriate than an outflow boundary condition. Let's take a look at some examples of how these inflow and outflow boundary conditions were applied in CFD modeling. Suppose we are to model the flow of this swimming pool by CFD. As we can see, the pool consists of two inlets and one outlet. The computational domain consists of the main water body and some part of the pipe flow before the water enters the pool and after the water exits the pool. We can use velocity inlet boundary conditions for the two inflow boundaries since by knowing the pump capacity, we can easily determine the pipe flow velocity. For the outflow boundary, we can use the pressure outlet boundary conditions. Since we can determine the static pressure at the outlet based on the water level. If we can assume that the pipe flow at the outlet is fully developed, then we can also use the outflow boundary condition. However, since the static pressure can be easily obtained and it may be hard to ensure that the flow would be fully developed, the pressure outlet boundary condition 
would be a better option than the outflow boundary condition. Next, suppose engineers are studying the aerodynamics of a car and they conducted some wind tunnel test. Although the wind tunnel can obtain global quantities such as drag, lift, side force, and the corresponding moments easily, it would be difficult to obtain details of the flow such as shear stresses, velocity and pressure distributions, and so on. To obtain those detailed flow properties, the engineers have to complement the wind tunnel test with CFD simulations. Normally, the experimental data will be used to validate the CFD solution. Therefore, the CFD settings should be based on the wind tunnel test configuration. As such, it would be appropriate to create the computational domain in such a way that its cross-sectional area is based on the opening of the wind tunnel nozzle. Therefore, the computational domain would be a rectangular box. This would be the inlet, while this would be the outlet. Notice that the length of the domain is based on the length of the test section. Since the velocity of the experimental test is known, the use of the velocity inlet boundary condition would be appropriate. As for the outlet, since the flow might still be developing due to the short downstream distance, it would be appropriate to use pressure outlet boundary condition. However, it is also possible to place the outlet at further downstream such that the flow at the outlet could reach a fully developed stage, thereby allowing the use of outflow boundary condition. Note that in these two examples, we haven't discussed the boundary conditions for the other boundaries except the inlet and outlet. Now I would like to introduce another commonly used boundary condition, which is perhaps the simplest one. It's the wall boundary condition. The most intuitive way to apply the wall boundary condition is to set all the domain boundaries right next to a solid wall as the wall boundary condition. For example, for the domain of the swimming pool, the four sides and the bottom boundaries are adjacent to solid walls. Therefore, they should be set as a wall boundary condition. The same goes for these pipe flows boundaries. Since fluid cannot pass through a wall, the normal component of velocity relative to the wall is set to zero. Also, because of no slip condition, the tangential component of velocity is set to zero as well. In CFD, it is also possible to let the fluid slip along the wall, which is done by setting the shear stresses equal to zero. As such, the wall becomes an invisible wall. No boundary layer will be developed along the wall since there is no viscous effect. For example, for the top boundary of the swimming pool domain, we can simplify the problem by assuming that the free surface of the pool is a flat plane and that the flow is steady. Therefore, the water level is fixed. Thus, we can prescribe it as the free slip wall boundary condition. Similarly, for the vehicle aerodynamic modeling, we can apply the free slip wall boundary condition to the top and the lateral side boundaries since we do not expect the flow to pass through these boundaries and also no boundary layer should form along these boundaries. Notice that the wind tunnel is equipped with a moving belt in this region. The function of the moving belt is to eliminate velocity gradients. As we know, in a real driving situation, the car is moving through the still air. Whereas in the wind tunnel test, the car is stationary while the surrounding air is moving. These two flow systems are similar. 
if we keep the Reynolds number of the two flows the same. However, in reality, when the car is running through the steel air, the boundary layer will only form on the car surfaces and not on the ground. But in the wind tunnel test, the boundary layer will form on both the car surfaces and the ground surface. Therefore, engineers incorporate a moving belt in the wind tunnel test to eliminate the boundary layer on the ground. In the CFD, this can easily be achieved by setting the moving belt surface as the free slip wall boundary condition so that no velocity gradient will be formed on this particular region of the floor. Additionally, there is another way to achieve the same result. In CFD, we can also impose a translational or rotational velocity on a wall. In this particular case, we can assign the velocity which is equal to the inlet velocity on the boundary of the moving belt. Therefore, no velocity gradient will form on the moving belt surface since its velocity is zero relative to the air. The velocity boundary conditions is also applicable to the rotating wheels. If the wheels are rotating in the wind tunnel test, we can assign the same angular speed on the surface of the wheels in the CFD to simulate the rotating wheels. If the flow configurations are symmetrical or involve repetition, we can substantially reduce the size of the computational domain by applying symmetry boundary condition or periodic boundary condition. For example, suppose the flow around this F1 car is symmetrical about its center line. We can then model only one half of the flow by assigning the symmetric boundary condition. As such, we can reduce the size of the computational domain by half and therefore conserving the computer resources. The obtained result is assumed to be identical on both sides of the car. We need to be careful though when assuming that the flow is symmetric. For some cases, even though the geometry of the body is symmetric, the flow around it may not be symmetrical. For instance, for the flow over a two-dimensional circular cylinder, it may be tempting to assume that the flow is symmetric about the red line because the cylinder is symmetric. As such, we would model only one half of the flow to reduce the size of the computational domain. However, at certain Reynolds number range, vortex shading will occur and render the flow unsteady and unsymmetrical. Thus, the assumption that the flow is symmetric is wrong. To correctly model the flow, the computational domain should include both the upper side and the lower side of the flow and perform an unsteady simulation, thus enabling the CFD to capture the vortex shading phenomenon. As for the periodic boundary condition, there are translationally periodic and rotationally periodic boundary conditions. In the case of translationally periodic boundary condition, the flow we intend to model involves repetitions such as this cross flow heat exchanger. We only need to model this part of the flow region and applying the translationally periodic boundary condition to these two edges. In the case of rotationally periodic boundary condition, one typical example is the radio heat sink used for electronic cooling applications. As we can see, the radio heat sink has cyclic symmetry geometry. That is, we can copy this part of the fin around the center of the base to construct the complete heat sink. Therefore, we can model only one set of the fin instead of the entire heat sink. We do so by imposing rotationally periodic boundary condition on these two planes. To summarize, 
some knowledge of the flow is required for modeling the flow successfully in CFD. This is because the accuracy of the CFD solution depends on the input from the CFD user, such as the modeling assumption, the boundary conditions, the suitable domain size, and so on. For inlet and outlet boundaries, the option are velocity inlet, pressure inlet, pressure outlet, and outflow boundary conditions. Which combination of these inlet and outlet boundary conditions to use depends on what information about the flow is available to the CFD user. There are a few types of wall boundary condition. The one resembling the solid boundary is the no slip wall boundary condition. The other types of wall boundary condition include the free slip wall, which is for modeling the flow without the viscous effect, and the velocity wall boundary condition in which the velocity can be translational velocity, such as the one used for modeling the moving belt, or a rotational velocity, such as the one used for modeling the rotating wheel. If the flow configuration is symmetric, or involve repetition, we can model a portion of it by using symmetric boundary condition or periodic boundary conditions, thus conserving the computer resources. This is the end of the video. Thanks for watching.